So welcome to tonight's program, Why Indigenous Canoes, uh, Indigenous Resurgence, and so much more with Dr. Vicente Diaz. My name is Amy Lusto, and I'm the Community Outreach Librarian here at the Belmont Public Library. Thank you all for being here and to the Friends of the Library for helping make this event possible. I invite you all to get in touch with me with any questions or program ideas, and I'll put my email address and phone number in the chat. Please also fill out our survey at the end. I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. And just to note that we are recording tonight's session and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for future viewing. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but feel free to put your questions in the chat as they occur to you and we'll start with those. So without further ado, Vince Diaz is a professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota, where he is the founder and director of the Native Canoe Program. This program uses traditional indigenous watercraft and indigenous water-based ecological knowledge and technology from across Oceania and the native Great Lakes and Mississippi River to advance community-engaged research, teaching, and service. Please help me welcome Vince Diaz. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm gonna uh, switch to uh, screen share here. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm on it right already. Can you see my screen? No. Yes? I can't, but maybe other people can. No. Is that a yes, a thumbs up? Seeing some thumbs down. Oh. So there's a thumbs down still going. So let me see what's happening. Uh, How about now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that little clunky thing there. Um, how's that? Good. Yeah, I'm trying to get my uh, screen to work. Should I wait a little bit longer or shall I go ahead and go? I think you're good. Go ahead. Okay. So thanks everybody for taking your um, time out to listen to this. I was happy to uh, to uh, share this with a different audience um, than I'm normally used to. Uh, and uh, because I think as I hope you'll see, there's um, a lot writing on what most people may not recognize as, uh, as, as something quite significant for indigenous people, particularly people who have deep relationships with uh, uh, bodies of water uh, for travel, for, uh, for cosmological reasons, et cetera. Everybody is dependent on water, but, but some of us have a particularly deep relationship with water. <clears throat> I have three claims that, uh, that uh, I want to, to um, begin with. Uh, the first is that um, how a university, how a university native community collaboration around native canoe cultural revitalization. And here I'm talking about Dakota people from uh, Minnesota and displaced Pacific Islanders, specifically Micronesians from the island of Chuuk. Uh, but displaced in the plains of rural Western Minnesota is also proving to be a crucial and hence a critical site of indigenous political, cultural, and intellectual resurgence for the 21st century. And I'm going to define my terms as I go. This crucial site is a critical site. It's a critical site for also countering settler colonial logics and relations as well as uncritical scholarship and knowledge production. So indigenous watercraft, and when I refer to this, I also refer to what I call the craft work of traditional ecological knowledge about land, water, and sky, and the work especially of enacting deep relations of kinship and reciprocity with them. 
these have tremendous carrying capacity and they cover a lot of ground. And by this, I mean both literally and metaphorically. In other words, as I hope you'll see, the stakes are great in indigenous canoe revitalization. This is something that my uh, my colleagues and friends across the Pacific know very deeply because of the, the centrality of voyaging canoes to our very histories and existences. But I think out here in Turtle Island, unless you're an indigenous person who is involved in canoe revitalization in, in the Great Lakes or the Pacific Northwest where there's a very robust movement or in river valleys, for example, um, for most people, they'll think about canoes as a, a recreation, simply a recreational thing. The third thing I wanted to say was that for indigenous people who have deep, and by deep, I mean old and rich and substantive, sometimes dense relationships uh, with bodies of water, like rivers, lakes, and oceans more than others, um, so much and even more ride on the survival and revival of native watercraft and the craft work of making relatives. That this kind of work in turn can inform the work we must do in other critical matters like climate crisis, fighting anti-blackness and ending extractive and predatory capitalism and liberal governance. In other words, even more is at stake in not just building canoes, but how we do them. So tonight, uh, I want to focus on only two of these larger stakes, the whole interest uh, and importance of making kin in the question of making futures, but also making kin and making futures with new and old conceptions of technology that draw from the strategic juxtaposition, putting side by side together uh, um, old uh, knowledge systems and technology from indigenous contexts and new technologies such as new visualization uh, of like virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. So digital, digital media. I'm wondering why my uh, my PowerPoint's not advancing. I'm going to try to do that again, okay? It looked like it froze. Can you see my screen again? Yes, you're on the three claims slide. This is not the one I was looking for. <laughs> I'm looking for my PowerPoint. It somehow disappeared. Does that work? Yes. Oh, and it's advancing even. Okay. So let me let me set the the, the tone with uh, with two uh, quick uh, materials. The first is a five minute clip from a recent uh, Pioneer Public TV episode uh, on a canoe project that we're working on, and this will really uh, sum up a lot of uh, uh, the, the 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 sort of hands on work. I'm going to ask you, Amy, if you can play that. Um, the Minnesota public TV clip, and I'll tell you when to stop. Or sure. we'll stop here. Yep, you stop share, and then I will share. Okay. Can you see and hear it? Yeah. Thank you. 
we come from a people that have thousands of years of traveling through these kinds of crafts and the ability to sail long distance using knowledge about the environment, stars, waves, clouds. To find Micronesian canoes in the plains of Minnesota shouldn't shock us because we have voyaging and movement in our cultural DNA. My name is Gabriel Elias, and I'm one of the leaders here in uh, our Micronesian community uh, that resides in this area. I live here in town, Milan, and we built a canoe. <laughs> So I teach here at the University of Minnesota American Indian Studies. I'm from Micronesia, from the island of Guam, and with lineage to some of the other islands. I started to get to know the folks from my island. Brought my canoe, I have an outrigger canoe that I've had with me here. And they wanted to a canoe of their own. And uh, Michael and Gabriel from the community asked me to help them do that. I'm a historian, but I also look at the survival of seafaring traditions in Micronesia. So that work has, has got me working with men from Polowat Atoll. I've been doing work with them for about 30 years. I'm originally from Polowat, one of the island in Chuk State, in the federal state of Micronesia. And I live in Saipan with my family. I'm, I'm a navigator. I was ordained a navigator two or three years ago. Back home, that's what we use. We use canoe. We navigate, you know, like islands to get food, to go and fishing. So that's how, since, you know, like when you, I was small, I started, you know, like going with my father, with my uncles and cousins. And then I helped them carve canoe when I was, you know, like still a young boy. I miss what I've been doing back home. Like when I was young, I used to go swimming on the beach, uh, play with friends, go fishing with my uncles. Life is very, like uh, really free and unique. Uh, over here, it's totally different. It's a different environment, different life. With the help of uh, a couple of grants at the university, we put together the funds to bring Mario and an assistant, Laureano. We also wanted them to do work with folks in the upper and lower Sioux communities to build a Dakota dugout as well, what they call Wata. Dr. Diaz talked about a few things that he's working on and that he wanted to um, be respectful of whose land the Micronesians are on. And traditionally, that's Dakota land. Our people use canoes to, to travel, to hunt, to uh, go wild ricing, to do a lot of things, you know, and that was a part of who we are as Dakota. You're gonna shape it more, Mario? Yeah, shape it more over here, make it a little bit smoother, and then... So the plan was to have a group of uh, Lower Sioux members, a group of Upper Sioux members, and the Micronesians to work with Mario and his assistant on these different canoes. <laughs> So we have a little one that was made a couple Thanksgivings ago. The dugout that Mario is helping us with. He went to the Montevideo Museum and they have a few dugout canoes there. Um, the one that we have and then other research they did to look at it um, to, to make it close enough, you know. Tawata Gahupi. Ta tree wata boat gahupi means they're like a 
digging it out, they're taking out that inner membrane. Chawata gahupi. That's that's how you would say dugout canoe or making a dugout canoe. I myself, I am Lakota, we're more horse people and bull riders. My children are Dakota, and um, it's just really important to know who you are and where you come from and uh, you know, embrace that. I'd recur, you know, like there's big difference because Taka uh, Kemi is only really one, you know. one hall. Am I back on? Yep. Okay, so the second thing I wanted to to use to sort of set the stage as well is uh, it's a, some, a couple of quotes from the late uh, Tongan uh, 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 intellectual Apeli uh, uh who is someone who uh, I want to point out turned to fiction and essays to become one of uh, our leading intellectual figures uh, in Pacific studies and his work has attracted a lot of other people to the Pacific because among other things he's, he, he had us thinking about Oceania uh, in more expansive but I also want to also say in contractive terms as well, um, or, or better yet, keep attention between the expansiveness of our cultures and our histories, but without losing sight of the importance of our connections to specific islands and this, the, the, the primacy of, of our connectedness to place. And so uh, in short, the canoe is, is, is one of these things, canoe, uh, and, and canoe culture knowledge is one of these things that that bids us to understand culture, history, uh, and and so much more as a complex relationship between um, deep connectedness to place and the cultures that come out of that, the specificity. But how also how that specificity and depth in in knowledge of a place. It's also forged through deep to extensive travel from other places. And so uh, a lot of us often talk about the relationship between routes to, to specific places and routes, uh, with routes uh, connoting mobility. So in, in the Pacific, indigenous uh, culture and history is, uh, doesn't simply uh, favor one or the other and routes and to deep connection to specific places and the ability to, to travel far and wide, both in time and space and time space are not mutually exclusive, but they work together to produce very deep and powerful ideas about what it means to be native. But okay, there's a couple of quotes that I wanted to, uh, to foreground. Uh, the first one is, um, the first one is, is, uh, is this quote that where he, he um, he writes, to remove a people from their ancestral and natural surroundings or vice versa, or to destroy their lands with mining, deforestation, bombing, large scale industrial and urban developments and the like, is to sever them not only from their traditional sources of livelihood, but also, and much more importantly, from their ancestry, their history, their identity, and from their ultimate claim for legitimacy of their existence. And what I wanted to do is, is to flesh this out a bit more in relation especially to local, um, what he calls ecological knowledge, as well as indigenous conceptions of technology that comes from those kinds of knowledge systems. So he, uh, what he called ecological based oral traditions and corresponding notions of ecological time. Um, he defined ecological time as, as time that is circular or seasonal based on close observations and relations with nature. And I want to read this passage here. Um, natural phenomenon such as cycles, cyclical appearances of certain flowers, birds and marine creatures, shedding of certain leaves, faces of the moon changes and prevailing winds and weather, weather patterns, which themselves mark the commencement of and the set, uh, set the course for cycles of human activity, such as those related to agriculture, terrestrial and marine foraging, trade and exchange, and of course, voyaging, and all their associated rituals, ceremonies, and festivities. Hence, where time is circular, 
It does not exist independently of the natural surroundings and society. So what we're talking about here is the evolution of societies that are deeply connected with, uh, with the knowledge about the, the cycles and the seasons. And he offers this definition of technology, the interconnectedness between nature and human society as foundational uh, for indigenous knowledge systems and indig indigenous definitions of technology, quote, of equal importance in the consideration of the relationships between Oceanian societies and nature is the role of technology. The driving force that propelled human activities was the knowledge and the skills developed over centuries, fine-tuned to synchronize actions with the regularities of nature. And we should also add the anomalies and the irregularities that nature also throws at us. As it provided the vital link between society and nature, technology cannot be dissociated from or seen to be independent of either. It was a vital and a compatible component of the cycles. Technology here is, is the mediation between nature and society. And this is not necessarily a new um, uh, insight, but how it plays out is makes a world of a difference. When we understand what I will uh, talk about in a moment uh, through the framework called indigenous relationality. But I want to pause just a little bit longer um, because I said that, that you know this is this is canoe building and more and more that there's just a lot of stake at stake in it. He was writing in relation to the need to imagine, write, and enact history in our own terms. Uh, and and so his observations about ecological knowledge and time and 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 technology was in the context for imagining and writing histories as we started to get more um, um, engaged and implicated with the interest of foreigners over the last 500 years. And so what we're dealing with here is smack into the, the thicket of um, indigenous survival uh, and, and uh, thriving uh, through the challenges of settler colonialism and empire and all, all these other systems that come with privileging their definitions of history and their definitions of technology and their definitions of knowledge. So he wrote, for a genuinely Oceanian historiography, we could use this notion to reconstruct some of our past in terms of people's endeavors, always to adapt and to localize external borrowings and impositions, fitting them to their familiar cycles. In this way, they actively transform themselves rather than just being passively remodeled by others. I want to suggest to you just very quickly that, that among other things, Apelia Ofa gives us a very, um, the, the beginnings of, of a, a way of understanding uh, culture identity as dynamic, expansive, uh, but also utterly tied to um, knowledge of, of our localities, of our place. And later in this uh, presentation, I'm going to uh, focus not on history, but on the idea of reclaiming technology for imagining the future now. And this is a term that we use in indigenous studies called indigenous futurities. With futurities, not just it's not just jargon, but it's a word to, to distinguish between conventional ideas of, a, of the future as something yet to come. Indigenous futurities instead is, is about engaging and activating the future as we know it in the present and how our histories and our places uh, through our knowledges and our indigenous technologies uh, furnish us with the means to, to enact the future now. Um, there's a much more sophisticated definition of, the, of history as something that lies before us. Um, uh, and, and, and so, but, but uh, you should get here a sense of a cyclical uh, or at least that indigenous people have radically different notions of time, space, and, uh, and for that reason, um, uh, knowledge systems and technologies. So a very quick outline. I wanna answer very quickly, why canoes? So what's up with canoes? I wanna cover a few key words, resurgence and indigenous relationalities, because these are some of the things that are at stake 
in building canoes together between Pacific Islanders and American Indians. And finally, uh, I want to cover the dimensions of that work as it involves um, putting together indigenous canoe technology and knowledge associated with that, that craft work of knowledge that I, I referred to uh, earlier, uh, and new media, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality um, um, in, in, uh, in, in new questions about how we design and make things. So being informed by that. So why canoes? Uh, we just we're, we put up a, 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 an exhibit uh, at the University of Minnesota called Why Canoes? And, and of course, exhibits have to be lyrical. And so this was, this was our attempt at, at, at the poetic. So capacious vessels and indigenous futures of Minnesota's peoples and places. But why canoes? Because they're beautiful, because they're functional, because they're fun to use, because they're feats of advanced hydro engineering, and because they're sacred, because they can move us and teach us how to balance properly, because they link us to land, water, and air, past, present, and future, because we need to move differently, together, properly, because we have so much to learn and they have so much to teach us. In, in, in more abstract terms, um, because we're academics, and so uh, <laughs> we, uh, you have to get your money's worth, Native canoes are, we can say, capacious. They have tremendous carrying capacity. They perform well, and they can cover a lot of ground. Hence, native canoes are great for building good relations, for teaching and learning, which have done well can also become great vessels for all kinds of other political and intellectual work. And because we're academics, we also have to be systematic and even methodical and, and really elaborate and spell it out uh, to the point of uh, students falling asleep in class. So I'm not gonna do that, but I have an inventory here of some of the stakes involved in why canoes. Pride, for example, um, cultural and spiritual well-being and competence, which with canoes out in the open ocean can be the difference between life and death. Language revival, all across where canoes are being revitalized, these are powerful vessels for language revitalization. Environmental stewardship, um, political activism, political leadership, economic survival and flourish, nation building, and I add here for academic inquiry, especially in the field of native studies, a distinct brand of knowledge uh, of research and knowledge production that uh, steers very close to indigenous traditions, but also counts as a uh, as a, that can run with the best of academic uh, knowledge production. Trust me that I can spend hours on each one of these with, and give you examples after examples from, from natives, communities, where water, uh, uh, that have deep relationship with water. Um, let me walk through uh, two, three terms that uh, uh, that are absolutely crucial here. The first one is resurgence. And just think about that, that root word surge to, to move forward. Well, resurgence is a term that describes indigenous political, cultural, spiritual, intellectual movements, social movements for social justice, for decolonization, for sovereignty, for knowledge reclamation for cultural revitalization. In many ways, everything that I said uh, uh, in, that, in that list, why canoes, are key elements of resurgence. And I hope you got a sense of that already. So this is heavy stuff. This is not, this is not just a, a, a recreational thing, but recreation is also important in this. So, Across Oceania, there's the resurgence of uh, political movements have also been accompanied with, with, uh, with cultural revitalization, specifically around the canoes. Uh, these are just, just some pictures I grabbed over the years from across uh, Oceania, where we have um, really robust movements all over the place. And you see just some of the different uh, kinds of canoes and uh, events. Um, 
in coastal regions of the con of continents, both in North America and South America. The, that first big one there to the left, Suquamish hosting since the 1980s, um, up and down the Pacific Northwest from Alaska to to uh, to Washington, annually different communities and different clans bring their canoes and and they they end up they they paddle to uh, a, a alternative site uh in a big celebration some really beautiful canoes in in the pacific northwest coast salish people uh but it's not restricted to the coast um the um and and i'll get to that in a moment but the kinds of canoes we're talking about are wooden uh cedar planks uh but also tool uh, reeds like this here. Uh, these are just some examples, and and the um, and and uh, in riverine lakes and, and regions, the Great Lakes region, for example. Um, the best uh, quote that I found about canoe uh, about the description of this terrain here uh, in the Great Lakes and the and riverine. Uh, um, regions is that kind of terrain where to travel at all is to travel by water. When I moved to the University of Michigan in 2001, the first thing I learned was that Anishinaabe uh, and Anishinaabe, Odawa, Potawatomi folks of Michigan understand themselves to be a water people uh, and, and, and were right in the thick of the revitalizing birch bark traditions. Um, I want to move a little slower here with this term indigenous relationality. It's another buzzword, but it's a really important buzzword for us. We're in a moment in, in, in academia where all the disciplines are getting interested in native studies and what's happening in native studies. It's, it's a growth, it's a moment of tremendous growth. Um, and um, and it's also causing concern because there's, as you might imagine, mainstream society has pretty stupid ideas about native people. And so there's some really romanticized nonsense out there. And you cannot be sure that academics wanting to get on into the action are gonna be any different. So I'm, I'm really, it's really important for us to define our terms and to take control of the terms about how we talk about native, native traditions, knowledges and stuff. One of the key ones is, is, is uh, indigenous relationality. This is a concept, it's an abstract concept, but it's a distinct form of relational thinking. And relational thinking is this idea that to understand something, you have to always understand it in some relationship to, some, to, to something else, Oft, almost often, something that is assumed to be diametrically opposite of it or antithetical to it, it's fundamentally not like it. But relational thinking actually forces us, forces us to say, if you really wanna understand that thing, you need to understand it in some kind of complicated relationship to other things, including that which has been said to be its diametrical opposite. And this is a bid to move beyond uh, what's called the, the 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 shortcomings of binary logical thinking, either or. But it's a it's a form of the relationality that we 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 privilege here is relations of kinship and relations of reciprocity, reciprocal caregiving and mutual obligations that exist between humans and the animate and the inanimate worlds, um, and these relations of kinship to looking at them as ancestors, as relatives, for example, um, often extending to inan the in inanimate worlds, Dakota people, uh, 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 rocks are, are sentient be beings. Uh, I think in the Pacific, uh, canoes are at once objects, at the same time, also animated beings, sentient beings. Um, but, this extends to the relationship between land, water, and sky themselves. They have relational, they have kinship relations with each other, and humans have kinship relations with them. Um, so these are forms, and, and so you have first and foremost um, kinship 
relations, ancestral relations between these things. A step further, I think that's really important in understanding indigenous relationalities is that in most of the indigenous communities, the definition that people use in the vernacular to refer to who they are almost always refers to something like the people or the real people. And what by that, it means just the, that species or that category of being that's opposed, say, to the winged people or the fish people or the, the mountain people or the sky people, uh, the sky persons or those relatives. And, and but with especially with the, the relation of reciprocity, you take care of me, I take care of you. Uh, I'm dependent, my well being is dependent on your health. Your health is depending on me. Those kinds of things. The idea of making good on those relationships is the very thing that defines what it means to be a human. So, what operationalizes the vernacular definitions of what it means to be a human across these different uh, languages is something like being good on the instructions, the original instructions, which are almost always couched as sacred, passed on from some deity to, to make good. That's the definition of what it means to be indigenous. That's what animates the concept indigeneity, the claims and conditions of Aboriginal belonging and difference to specific places that differentiate indigenous people from non-indigenous people. So indigenous relationalities can be seen as alternative epistemologies, different ways of knowing, di different ontologies, ways of being, axiologies, ways of knowing, we can call these social practices, and can be contrasted uh, to settler colonial relations and logics, and I should also add affects, so uh, their uh, Babson College, uh, in, I think it's in your town, right, in Belmont uh, or nearby. Uh, uh, it's one of our uh, friends in Indigenous Studies, uh, Kevin Brunel, who latest book called Settler Memory. It looks at affect uh, as a function of uh, settler colonial relations and logics. Settler colonial relations and logics uh, posits uh, identity in terms of individual or collective national selfhood that, that's defined in terms of private property ownership or state ownership of property, individual possessiveness, uh, draw, drawing from uh, certain perhaps stereotypical definitions of, of, uh, of uh, Judeo-Christianity, this idea of man's dominion over nature in the image of God or nature as resources. Um, indigenous relationalities is radically different from this. And for this reason, it's often referred to as radical relationalities. So indigenous relationalities is, is, a, is like a workhorse for indigeneity, which is itself an, the concept that's a workhorse for native studies as an academic field. Uh, and the kind of work that we do is almost always in some kind of engaged relationship with political, cultural, uh, intellectual resurgence in indigenous communities. So let me give two quick examples of, uh, of uh, uh, sort of entry level relationalities, one from Dakota. Um, the idea of the Kapemni is, is uh, you, you'll see this in a lot of the icon iconography of Dakota art and, and uh, religious ceremonies, protocols. The Kapemni basically means everything that's above from the, the sky onto the cosmos, the stars, um, is already reflected below on the earth, on this temporal plane. And some, at the same time, everything that's, that's, uh, that one finds to be true, uh, that takes place on this earthly plane, already also reflects. Uh, it's already reflected in the skies above. And, and it, uh, it's imaged like uh, inverted triangles, but it's really a twisting of a, of a plane so that it looks like a vortex, like, a, like this in blue there. Sometimes this has been mistaken as a cross, as one, that central image there. This is the Kapemni. 
And it's an extremely important, uh, this is also the image of the TP. Uh, and that point where the above the vectors of the, uh, intersect uh, above and below uh, is something like a sweet spot, a sacred point where things, where energy passes up and down. Um, in the Pacific, uh, I, I always use this example in the Marshall Islands, the, the word for, for island in the, in, in the Marshall Islands and, and, and found across other Micronesian uh, vernaculars is Ailang. And Ailang is not a mispronunciation of island. It's, it's, a, it's an indigenous term. The prefix I means currents and currents that begin from the ocean floor but go all the way up to the surface in, as waves and swells. But then it extends upwards to, to winds and then clouds. And then further up, the movement of celestial bodies. So I, currents. And if you miss the point, the, the, pre, the, the suffix uh, of, of the word is lang. Lan, I lang, lang. Lang uh, means sky. Uh, Lani, Rangi, Lang, Langit, these are cognates across the Pacific. This is an island. <laughs> the island, this is anything but a tiny remote self-contained entity phenomenon. So here is an expansive idea of, of an island. This island is nothing like the island that's been bequeathed to us in continental theory about islands. Um, I wanted to capture what I call canoe relationalities in this short piece. It's a six minute piece that I'm gonna ask uh, uh, um, Amy to show. And I'm going to uh, get off this. To know us properly, you need to know how we got here and how we continue to move through time and space. This is why we still value our, our canoes, because they connect us to how our ancestors sailed over thousands of miles of ocean, going from island to island without compasses. These abilities and more are held in our stories about stars, our oldest relatives. Stars point us to where we want or need to go, and they teach us how to tell time. We can say that stars steer us in our voyage on this canoe called Earth. <laughs> Okay. And the side my lab. And remember this is north. This is the northern star. I think I learned about the stars when I was very, very young, maybe in elementary school. Actually, my first uh, travel on a canoe from one island to another island was way back. I don't remember how old I was. Pafu means to look at and count stars. On a pandanus mat, shells are placed in a circle. The shells represent rising and setting points of select stars around an island or a canoe. And these rising and setting points are useful because they point toward meaningful locations around us. Tumur came during leaf and time. No more uh, breadfruit. And people were kind of hungry because they just eat uh, taro from the taro patch, no more breadfruit. It's a famine uh, star, and this is dying for famine. 
Wound means poison. So the fish are eating something that you should watch out for when you go fishing in the month of Un. At the same time, they said you don't catch a lot of uh, ocean fish in that month of Un because even the big uh, fish, they know the smaller fish they eat will be poisonous. So they, they don't waste time going out fishing. Stars are associating with uh, waves and uh, with the current. We were sailing to, from Polowa to Tamadam, and then on our way back, we were then talking stories, but one of the greatest navigator was with us, and he was sleeping. So he was sleeping, and all of a sudden he wake up and said, you're going wrong direction. So what? Uh, we're not heading for Polowa anymore. And just by feeling it, he was sleeping and he feel the way, you know, his body turned around. But even the, uh, you know, the way the uh, his then make himself uh, turn around, he knew, he already knew that the direction is not right. In the islands, we have a saying, the canoe is the people and the people is the canoe. How we steer our canoes, for example, sometimes you can't tell where the human body ends and where the ocean and sky begin. So too with the body of our islands, which begin from the ocean floor and are made up of currents and waves, winds and clouds, and extend all the way up to the stars. Stars that teach us everything, direction, time, seasons, and how seasons connect us to birds and to fish and to trees, like the breadfruit trees that our canoes are made from. Canoes whose own bodies connect land, water, sky, and people. For the canoe is the people, and the people is the canoe. You can stop it there. Um, I just want to pause to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Kayoko uh, Miyazaki in the in the audience who uh, shared some of her footage. Kayoko is a uh, uh, is a Japanese uh, filmmaker who uh, is very close to the people of Polowat and we um, and knows Mario and some of these people. I also wanted to uh, uh, earlier I I I described the uh, work around the tr canoe journeys or tribal journeys in the Pacific Northwest. And, um, uh, and that one picture uh, was the year that the Suquamish hosted all these canoes. And uh, I see in the uh, uh, face, uh, Zoom that Barb Santos, who runs uh, the uh, Suquamish canoe program for the kids uh, is, has joined us. Uh, nice to see you, Barb and, and Kayoko. Um, let me let me uh, go back to my screen. So, um, I'm uh, Amy. I'm going to take another about seven minutes to wrap up. There's a, a little bit more information, but I hope the 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 video, uh, the first video, gave you a sense of the kind of work we do between Micronesians and Dakota people. Um, for the last three or four years, everything we've been doing, uh, we try to do uh, in, in good relations with the Dakota people here. Uh, um, besides uh, not wanting the work we do that serves our cultural revitalization as dis displaced natives on Dakota land, besides not wanting to uh, replicate settler colonial logics and relations by simply doing our own thing, here, as if it, as if uh, this new land was simply uh, some ours to, for taking, uh, we uh, we labor to uh, to do the work of our cultural revitalization, revitalization uh, in ways that are in good relations in, uh, with the Dakota people. Uh, but it also opens up the the really interesting reality that in the 21st century, um, to be a good Micronesian navigator. 
you're going to also have to learn the ecological knowledge, the looks of the clouds and the skies and the flora and the fauna of the places you end up in. So what it takes to be a good Micronesian navigator for this, these displaced Micronesians uh, is knowledge about where they came from, but also no, knowledge about the place they ended up in. So uh, this also doubles up the, uh, the need to be in good relations with the Kota people because the Kota have also their deep uh, ecological knowledge uh, and, and um, uh, um, about this place in particular. And so, uh, so in many ways, what we're trying to do is um, uh, being good relatives to, um, to, um, to the people we end up in. But this is also an academic uh, project. Uh, and so at stake here is, is how to do uh, research and knowledge production differently. So we work with computer engineers, we work with art, art and architect uh, folks. Um, and uh, um, I want to spend a, the last couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, what some of the things we're trying to do at the interface between traditional ecological knowledge from Micronesia and from Dakota informed by these relationalities, uh, different ways of th thinking about who we are in relation to different ways of thinking about our land, water, and skies as relatives. Um, but put that up against uh, uh, new technologies that, that are famous for uh, very powerful new forms of visual culture that also have the ability to, to mess with time and place in order to give us a, a radically different uh, kind of um, understanding of our bodies, our identities, uh, and, uh, and images and things and technology. Uh, that's what virtual reality does for a lot of us. Uh, and the question is what happens when we put these side by side, uh, not in a uh, hierarchical way, but in a way where where all of us are learning from each other. Uh, and that learning in, includes um, uh, people from different academic disciplines who are, what we have in common is, is you know, we may not speak the same languages, but we know something's messed up here. Uh, and that uh, the stakes in, in doing, uh, in, 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 uh, in knowledge production are radically different. So, uh, so we start by, by digitizing the canoes, but also thinking about how digital technology can also be compared and contrasted to the, the technologies of, of our traditional watercraft and water-based knowledges. So, um, but of course, the first thing we can do is to create the virtual environments. And so we can produce virtual reality voyaging, uh, which we, we've been doing. Uh, and what's fun here is that not only is it a visual where you put the goggles on, but it's also tactile and kinetic. So we rigged it so you have to pull a line to bring in the sail to move forward. And then we also have um, the feel of a, of a steering paddle uh, to turn the canoe around. Um, this is Dan Keefe, who is my main uh, uh, collaborator. Um, and so one of the things we call is designing with data, sailing with data. But we, we also try to redefine what we mean by data and design uh, by using the traditional technologies and knowledge. Um, and two things that I wanted to share is, is the virtual voyaging. And a second, uh, the, what we augmented uh, the PAFU mat that, that you saw, learned about in that short video. So here's. Uh, I'm going to try to show some clips of um, of uh, some of the folks. In <laughs> we bring them up to the, the campus. So. The visuals are still a little rudimentary. We just it's just uh, um, but we're able to to create a virtual environment with actual meteorological and, and astronomy um, coordinates. So these are just, we were able to replicate uh, data driven Chuk Lagoon and the skies there. 
So this is some of the, the views you could get in it when you're in there. Um, you can get a bird's eye view or you could be inside the canoe. And it's compelling enough so people think that they like start, they have these moments where they reach out. Um, this is uh, what it looks like uh, from outside. Uh, and this is uh, what you might, what might experience in, uh, in the virtual space with the goggles. The cool thing about this is we can get it to, so imagine a room or a gym or a park full of uh, folks and we give them the goggles and we're all in the same canoe. This is a prototype, so pardon the sort of cartoonish images. We put a papu mat on, on, on the canoe as well, so you can look down um, while you're also looking up if you forget what the stars are. This is a 24 hour cy cycle that in about a minute. So it, it turns dark and we can go 360 degrees around and watch the stars rise and set. Now we took the papu mat that you, uh, we described and we augmented that. Augmented reality is using uh, uh, computer-driven uh, virtual reality or other forms of project projection upon uh, uh, this reality. So objects augmenting or complementing objects with um, uh, sometimes um, uh, holograms and virtual images. Uh, this was at a gym in the, the Dakota uh, Youth Center uh, where we brought Micronesian kids and, and Dakota kids and um, we had a session on Dakota sky knowledge, and then we had a session on PAFU. Uh, here's a PAFU map with the stars representing the rising and setting stars. Uh, um, I, I'll, ship, I'll skip this. This is just another way of uh, describing what uh, Celestino described in the film, the rising and setting, this, the, the, the stars represent rising and setting points, and so can be seen as a kind a kind of map of the where stars uh, represent uh, locations on Earth, uh, and as we saw in the video, uh, stars are also associated with waves and swells. And so the sky is reflected in the in the ocean, and the ocean is reflected in the sky. I like to say that 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 land, water, and skies are proxies for each other, and they're proxies for uh, humans. This is a very first uh, iteration of what we were trying to do with, uh, with a, an augmented PAFU mat. Uh, so we, that's the mat we use. It's about eight by eight, a, a fine woven uh, pandanus mat and a three foot uh, sailing canoe from Polowat. Uh, and the first iteration was, uh, we decided to, to do projection because the exhibit that we produced this for had trouble, well, we decided it wasn't worth it at the time that we had to try to figure out apps for all the different phones. This was for an exhibit in Australia, the Asia Pacific Triennial uh, that just finished in uh, Brisbane. Um, and um, we had an exhibit called Air Canoe and uh, I produced that film and um, this augmented. So here's a, a second generation of what, uh, what we hoped to pull off. So on the mat, you'd have the waves, the, the, the eastern swell of the, of, uh, of um, associated with Milep, the star, and then night comes and the stars start rising uh, overhead. And this goes on and then, and then when the sun comes up, uh, the stars will disappear and you'll see the water again. Um, so, um, and, and then that footage is, 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 is actually that swell, that pre that dominant swell that comes from, um, the West, the East, uh, if you're in Polowat coming really from due East. And so you see it there. Um, and, and we tried to capture also the, 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 the shadows. So, uh, you can see in the lower 
the lower uh, right-hand corner, uh, a projection of the shadows as well uh, as the sun travels overhead. Here's a spill of uh, the final, as it looked like in the, in the museum, uh, at the exhibit. And we test ran it with the Micronesian community before we sent it off. So what you're seeing on the left is what's projected below on the map. And that's the sky. So let me just read this and, and finish up with this. This was the, uh, the, the text that accompanied the, um, the, um, the augmented mat. Uh, and this was our interpretation of what happened when we put these together. Augmented reality, ag augmented papu, augmented uh, adjective to complement and expand upon. At the center of the traditional papu mat, from Polawat is a voyaging canoe, which we augment with projected rays of light to represent the cycle of one Polawat day to capture multiple perspectives and scales. Knowledge, noun, what and how we know to be true. One perspective is that of a celestial simulation that is anchored to shells that traditionally represent rising and setting stars and their trek across the sky. Though we see what navigators see as they sit on a canoe and look up, the projection falls instead on the map below. As the sun rises, stars morph into waves. This is the waters of the Chuk Lagoon. This perspective is also of a bird overhead or further from outer space. But if you look at it from above uh, and look at the shadows when, the, when it's daytime and you see this, the water coming up, you also get a sense that it's a view from below, uh, from fish and other marine beings beneath the canoe. Reality, noon, keeping noun, keeping things real. The augmented papu mat adds a second person perspective to that of time. Uh, if you circle the mat, you will see yet another projection, a swell that comes from uh, Myla, the rising altair. As the sun sets and the stars rise, the, sh the sail's shadow lengthens, then disappears for we, for we also aspire for the effect of the real. Augmented reality, noun, your thoughts here. We had a section there where you know, what, well, what, do you, what does this make you think about things now? But for us, projection as a, mi a mixed reality medium invites us to meditate on our relationship to place by presenting reality through multiple perspectives and different scales. Augmented engineering with ancient indigenous canoe knowledge allows us to ponder how rootedness in place and roundedness through mobility inform ways of knowing through distinct worldviews. Obviously, I can spend more time fleshing this out, uh, but I wanted just to end with uh, uh, a takeaway for us, and that's wisdom, uh, a, a definition of wisdom. Wisdom uh, to us would be seeking good by innovating on time-honored knowledge. With that, I'll stop. And uh, we have about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, Amy, for questions and answers. Yeah, um, I haven't seen any in the chat, but maybe people need a minute okay. to collect their thoughts. Um, while they do that, uh, I meant to put in the link to our survey here, which you can grab because once the program ends, once the Zoom ends, that will disappear. So you can click on that and have it open for later. And yes, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, Ronnie. Um, hi, um, this is very interesting. And um, my question to you, uh, Vincent, is did you manage to actually um, build a canoe? Um, or did you, did you use authentic tools to build the canoe? Or were you trying to also replicate the tools that were being used? Um. Because was this a type of heritage, right? heritage so, site so, you were working in or something? Yeah, the, the, there was no, um, I, I think one of the things that, that uh, we're certainly interested in is, um, is more expansive and dynamic ideas about what constitutes tools and indigenous tools in particular. So of course, uh, most people would say traditional tools and authentic indigenous tools were first um, 
carving with shell adds us or with stone. Uh, but uh, we used, uh, um, um, had no problems using um, 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 chainsaw to bring the tree down after praying. Praying was a tool as well, you know? So, so we want to keep it open. There was, uh, uh, why should we try to fell that tree with a stone axe if we can uh, want it to concentrate uh, uh, on, on. So I'm not dismissing traditional tools and traditional, but I am also expanding how we think about traditional uh, to, uh, uh, and tools. So um, I would describe it as mixed. Uh, there was an interest among the Dakota to learn how to carve with an adze, uh, since they hadn't done that in a long time, uh, or with an ax. And that was part of the motivation to bring uh, navigators and canoe builders from Polowat to teach them that. Um, um, so there was some of that, uh, but there was a lot of things at stake. Uh, and so we had, um, we, we sort of had the luxury and the, um, the license to prioritize around time, what we want to focus in and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. A big part of this was developing relationships. Okay. You know, so that's a good question. I'm not, I hope I didn't come off as dismissive, you know. No, it's just that I come from a different perspective because we have something um, similar in Ireland and they're called Corux. Uh -huh. And um, they would stay very true to the um, traditional way of carving these out and stuff. So I was just wondering as to, were you, were you, were you limited by time yeah. constraints yeah. or, you know, I don't, did you I don't, end up with, a, I guess my question is at the end of this, did you end up with a canoe that was years that she could show in a museum or something is, I guess my question. <laughs> well, if, if, if they want to do that, you know, I mean, uh, but yeah, and, and what they do, what the communities do with it is up to them. You know, um, okay. so um, I I think I think knowing the tradition, knowing traditions is really important, uh, and knowing how okay. to do that, but also uh, not restricting ourselves to to uh, 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 static definitions of, of tools and changing environments and changing things, and so keeping that going. So I, I get that, and and I think uh, uh, you know, but it's just it's also a reaction to how a lot of people also have very uh, hapless, I think, ideas about natives and authenticity, and so if you don't do it this way, then you're no longer native, kind of thing. All right, <laughs> yes, you know yeah, I mean? it's yeah. just interesting that seven thousand miles away, there is such a correlation and such a connection with the same type of skill yeah. and the goals of the connection with fishermen, survival, yeah. island people. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that, I guess that's what I'm saying, you know, we, where, where we're all so where connected. Are you, uh, where are you speaking from? I'm actually speaking, I, I live here uh, in America, but um, I'm originally from Kerry in Ireland. So I would have grown up with watching nice. people um, out on the ocean nice. fishing with corks and nice yeah <laughs> it's just oh, fascinating i just part this, of this is just amazing is also, to me. part of this project is also because it's in mylan and mylan is a town that is very strongly uh pride and it has a lot of pride around their norwegian uh scandinavian heritage um uh we also eventually want to build a viking boat <laughs> <laughs> nice. it's been done actually here and sailed all the way to Norway and back along. They, it was built in a farm in inland and then trucked a, a replica Viking boat. This was in the, the 1980s. And then trucked to Duluth and then, and then sailed on the Great Lakes to the St. Lawrence, Lawrence and out to the Atlantic and up to Norway and then back. And then they took it back to that farm uh, and they built a museum around it. <laughs> you could, you could uh, Google it and check it out. They have a okay. virtual tour. Uh, at least you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bravens. Uh, By what a great talk. <laughs> um, so I, I, I just was wondering whether you 
what what other applications for the um augmented uh, knowledge augmented reality you know thinking in our context what what where we can go with that you know how it can be used <laughs> i don't know just that's, curious that's, about whether you've thought about that thanks i have uh the sky's the limit <laughs> you know uh that my the 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 big project i'm very interested in uh is uh is developing a, a virtual, a really, really compelling virtual uh, atolls for places like Polowat, that where the islands are going to be uninhabitable very quickly, and, and you're going to have generations of kids growing up away from the islands and potentially disconnected to the stories of, of those islands in the way that their their parents and grandparents all, all that stuff. And, and the idea here is to use virtual realities not as a, a replacement of of the place, but as a like a holding, like a holding place, until the point where the island is habitable once again. In the meantime, uh, if 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 uh, folks from Polawat and other endangered uh, uh, atolls are um, are going to have to live somewhere else, maybe the virtual the virtual island will 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 come next best thing to um, allowing them to maintain some relationship to a compelling likeness of that place. But what's beautiful about virtual reality is that your 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 um, again, it's not a replacement, but there are things that you could do with it. This this could be, you know, like a lot of people from Polowat um, socialize on Facebook. That's become a kind of virtual island for them you know we can we can we can make it much better than that that you know they can and 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 such a site can also be an archive for uh uh for depositing uh photos images stories you know so 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 it's all the power of a virtual i'm very mindful that i'm sounding excited uh, but I'm actually very leery of technology. And, and I hope the point came across that the West doesn't own technology. Right. <laughs> so the quick answer is the sky's the limit. <laughs> I was going to ask Thanks, him about the boundary waters. Uh huh. I wish I haven't been up there yet, but I know I'd love to go. There's a wonderful book called uh, Islands and, and Books on Islands by Louise Erdrich. Right. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, I assigned that in my classes because uh, I, think, I think she's dealing with the boundary waters and further on, right? So, uh, <laughs> so, but did you have a specific question about the boundary waters? Well, I actually, um, uh, we have canoed the boundary waters, even though we live oh. in Belmont, because oh, we have okay. because we family who live in Minneapolis. And oh. so we had the opportunity to, and it just struck me that, you know, many, it, you are so lonesome in the boundary waters that it, the, your, your discussion of the Micronesians and so forth and out in the, sort of out in the beyond, um, it's so much in a way like the boundary waters where we, when we canoed, we didn't see anybody else for four days. So I would. So if, if I, I, was, I guess my real question was, how do you, are, are you going to expand on this so that more people sort of um, build a relationship with the Micronesians? I mean, it's so important that people in our society understand the value and the uh, good works and the intelligence of all the people who have made their way in those atolls for thousands of years. I, I do. I, I do want to expand on that uh, and uh, uh, saying yes to requests for talks at, in Belmont is like a, a part of that. <laughs> you know? uh, but I wanted to go back to, to one of the things that if you, if you take a look at uh, Louise Urgis's book, and if you were to follow that, because it's a it's a it's a kind of memoir on a canoe across uh, up north, 
there's no way you can come out of that book feeling like you were alone in the waters out there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I suppose no you're way. right. <laughs> you know, you could take comfort that the ancestors are all around, or you have to be really careful because there's other beings all around you too. And those are those are written on the on on the on the rock walls and 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 you know so a, a big part of uh and one of the things i love about that book is she says she makes a claim that the 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 carvings and the the drawings on the caves some people say were written by the ancestors of modern ojibwe but she says no they were they were the modern ojibwe and by that she means that she has a definition of modern that takes it back thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago through the innovation of writing. And she talks about uh, 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 drawings on rocks as inscriptions, not unlike literature. And so she's not gonna allow the West to also own uh, writing uh, or innovation or progress or change but it's still indigenous relationalities. That, that is the test. Hi, Vince, I was just going to say uh -huh. something. <laughs> just commend you on the really fascinating project. Um, and, you know, as an academic, it's, um, it's wonderful to see work that's no longer reliant on already existing archives, which I think most of us academics rely on. And I think as an indigenous, Indigenous scholars, we're more and more now going to the ground and talking to knowledge holder experts and try to bristle with that knowledge and how to, you know, how, what do we do with it? How do we, you know, like you say, to innovate from that? And I really, I have to say, I'm a big fan of this idea of augmented reality. Uh, especially for our communities away from the uh, homeland. Um, as one of the most important things about those, um, those knowledges is how do you make the experience work in a place where you're no longer connected to the oceans, to the land. And, and I love the way that the, um, the, uh, the, the virtual goggles and even the way that you can sometimes now get the sense of when you're tugging at something, you can actually design, um, you know, handhold things that actually tug at you so that, you know, so that you can get the sense that we are, you're, you're raising the sail and you're literally doing it. So that idea of that to, to reanimate those, that those, knowledges in a way where if you're not going to make the the craft yourself you can yeah it's a it's, uh, yeah I, I can't i can't say um enough how the technology we you know with the, these particular knowledge we, we can just advance using um you know the modeling technology that you're using just looking at the way that you are uh, reconstructing the, the star systems and how that can be you know if not just for projecting in that sense but you can actually build a whole environment where you can walk in and recount like, oh, the hollow deck on those star trek kind of and it really does allow, I, we have a huge machinery of um, technology in my university, so we're doing similar kind of things, but not to the extent that you're doing it at. But at some stage, the, the matching of traditional customary knowledge worth the way to rethink and re-advance them and, and re-experience. I guess that's the main thing. It's, it's a different generation to re-experience yeah. what it is to be like on the ocean in these particular, yeah, yeah it's fascinating. So uh, yeah, I, I, and uh, you know, there's some wonderful way that you are rethinking the, recalibrating the, the indigeneity and the, and rethinking the whole logics of, you know, if we're not gonna route this knowledge through institutions like museums, how can we do it in a community? So, and, in, uh, intercultural or transcultural community so we can talk to the the uh, the people and where you are and the pacific and rethink how we can come together 
yeah, it's a wonderful project. So yeah. thank you, Vin. Well, thank you. You know, the, the first thing I want to say is, is that I'm not doing this in isolation and I'm also learning from you guys and everybody else that's, that's doing uh, related stuff. You know, the, 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 the we're, we're and, and that's what makes it exciting. I think also, um, you know, when I said the sky's the limit, that's not really true. I just wanted to, to you know, the limit is how we design these things. It's, it's really in the how and for what, you know? And so, so we, need, we need more, more of, of uh, uh, Native people doing these things. Uh, then as for the, um, I have no doubt that the technology is gonna allow us to simulate be, getting seasick. <laughs> it's, it's, it already happens on Zoom, you know? <laughs> but, but, uh, um, but I wanted to stress that this is, none of this is a replacement and ideally we're doing it simultaneously. We're going, you know, and so we have to find the proxies. So if, if the, if the Micronesians out here are, 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 are no longer living in Trip Lagoon, they're still on Dakota lands and waters and skies. They can still get in the river, you know, and, um, There, there's, there's another kind of really important insight here. The, the U.S. planes, and I'm really serious here, we're accustomed to thinking about it as a, as a waterless world. But the U.S. planes holds North America, at least the United States, largest body of water. And that's not the Great Lakes and that's not the Mississippi River. It's the Oglala Aquifer, which is underground. But that I had, Dakota knowledge about water doesn't, it also begins underground. There's underground stories. Like I think all the native people of, of the continent know about subterraneous worlds. You know, their realities begin don't begin from the ground up or just stay on the ground, you know, like, like island. An island begins at the bottom of the ocean floor. And so uh, the, the, the Métis anthropologist, feminist anthropologist uh, Zoe Todd often writes about the need to re really reconnect with indigenous notions of water where we think there's no water, you know, so, so, and this is the, 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 what I love about, if you go to Milan, Milan is about two thirds of the population are from Chuk, <laughs> two thirds. <laughs> it's like about 300 people. And so if you went there, you feel like you're in Chuk, except that in the winter time, there were, you know, like the women are wearing the floral skirts, but they're wearing sweats underneath it, right? <laughs> uh, but in the summer, it's like going to a village in one of the Chuk Islands the kids are running around playing volleyball, the women, the, you know, all that stuff. But what I like is that they actually say it reminds them of, of, of their island Romanum because, because Milan is actually a very, very, very tiny town that's surrounded by corn, uh, by soy and cornfields. And so it's like an atoll in the sense, it, if, if you think about uh, cornfields as like uh, uh, corn syrup, you know, it, it's also an ocean, a, a capitalist ocean that, that, you know, so little towns in the Northwest to these Micronesians under certain conditions remind them of being at home. You know, they're the majority. So this, it's, it's up for grabs. Uh, Elise had, a, I'm trying to see, I wanna make sure there's other questions. Elise? Yeah, thanks, Evan. So uh, just another sort of pragmatic or practical um, question in terms of, you know, the, the areas beyond national jurisdiction um, negotiations that are going on under the UN law of the sea. So the, the Pacific Islands put a strong case for the inclusion of traditional knowledge. And, I, and one of the things that we've had difficulty um, 
sort of you know pinning down is is how how that traditional knowledge is is uh, manifested and and how it it um, um, you know manages the the ocean in in sustainable terms and all all of that uh, in <clears throat> in the high seas area. So um, in fact, I'll be contacting you later about that. I'm finally getting this project off the ground um, to to kind of bring together data and and documentation. And I'm just wondering, you know, with that augmented reality how how we could use that as a tool possibly to to beef up that case so i i was wondering whether you had any ideas uh, about that or um i haven't gone of... that far in, in in terms of that i i did i do have a series of essays that sort of weighs in on some of the challenges around thinking about um uh, traditional seafaring within the rubric of uh, intangible cultural heritage uh, that I think is is, is is a big part of what you're talking about, right? That's that's the sort of template for, so I'm, I'm all for the, the move for, for getting it protected and freeing up the resources. I do think though that there's, uh, I worry a little bit about how the, the move to intangibility could, could actually ob obscure or obfuscate what, after all, is is a tradition that is highly visceral and tangible, you know. And so, uh, and so, there is the potential to to actually lose what's in front of our nose when when we have a second look or a more a different look at tangibility and physicality and materiality for. Uh, for uh, for things that haven't that haven't yet been adequately understood, you, you know what I mean. And so I, I fear that going to to intangible as as uh, as a corrective for cultural uh, historical preservation that used to rely only on like buildings and structures, you know, in favor of the more intangible values and stuff like that that is found in, in cultural practices. Um, that might be well and good for a lot of other things, but I, I think that, I mean, when I think about seafaring, that's super, super, super embodied and super, super tangible. And we haven't yet exhausted what that means and different ways to understand that. So none of this, none of what I say is uh, should be uh, seen as, uh, um, um, Putting a, trying to stall the work that around getting it all the recognition is, is important, but but it may be, for example, something around exactly how it is that um, navigators can feel directionality mm -hmm. in relation to the behavior of sea creatures that might furnish. The, the very kinds of measures that you're talking about, rather than being too quick to think about some abstract value of <laughs> relationalities, you know. So, so I, I I'm I'm very much a, a, and this is where it's ironic. Uh, virtual reality, most people would would see as not embodied, you know, but. The fact this virtual reality comes with its own kind of embodiment and materiality. And there may be something when you put this together with, with seafaring that gives us new insight into, into what feeling out there yeah. tells us about the kind of um, data that you're looking for, or it may require you require the United Nations to scrap or rethink what counts as data. You see what I mean? So or or, and, yeah. or the measures and so so that's 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 what uh you know yeah I, I, I wouldn't categorize it as either tangible or intangible. That's that's really UNESCO that's really UNESCO speak. I, it's uh that 
that has been categorized for some reason like that. And, and I, I fully agree. I, for, for, for me, it's really more about um, being able to, to demonstrate the depth of, of those relationships yes. and how those relationships are manifested through yes. all different types of knowledge that yes. that are really important for safeguarding the ocean. So and I would begin, yes, I, I completely agree from, from, from getting past the distinction between tangible and intangible to, to the need for new lens to, to understand this, this tradition. Because I think, for example, I'll give you some specific examples. I don't like the consistent description of PAFU as a star compass. Because I think it strips, it, for it, it subordinates um, Carolinian ideas about time space to the idea of cardinal directionality and compasses. By the same token, I don't like, I'm not a fan of the term wayfinding. Because though I, I, I'm, I acknowledge that these, this is different from compasses and GPSs and, and Western cartography, there's an unintentional or unconscious uh, eliding of indigenous instrumentality. PAFU is, is an instrument that Carolinians developed and or fine-tuned. You know, and, and and that should never be denied. Call it a different kind of instrument, a different kind of technology. So, so um, um, the 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 larger point is is the need for a fresh set of questions to ask of these traditions. You know, for and 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 it's very possible that putting these together with augmented and virtual reality tech, new technologies can give us some insight and some perspective that we have not had. Uh, 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 I, I know that I'm looking at Carolinian tra seafaring tradition differently from the lens of being out here with working with Dakota. It's making me revisit the relationship between sky, land, and water, and personhood in a way that has not really been looked at by anthropologists studying seafaring. So, so you see what I mean? So, so, but I, I don't have any answers. I'm sorry to say <laughs> these are, these are just provocations and, and, you know, ex exploration, but, but I try to take, to learn from them to know what they're doing, you know, so. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Vince. That's great. Hey Vince, can yeah. I ask you a question? How are you? How are you? <laughs> are you still in Chicago? Yes, I, I am. I am. I'm, I'm still in Chicago. I'm actually in Atlanta right now. So, okay. um, this is really exciting. Um, I was just thinking about uh, there was a comment earlier about um, scholars and research researchers having to use you know the archives and and I think you and I know um that quite often the archives is um not accessible for people like us and that it contains um basically a narrative right that's you know sort of in, in some in some ways a colonial narrative right um so this is really exciting I I look at what you're doing as uh, you know, an example of how we can create our own archives, right? Through mm -hmm. through this augmented technolo uh, technology, right? And um, and 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 so it's really making me exciting. And so um, thank you for introducing this to me because now I, I can you know go back and and talk to my students about this. I teach archives, but mm -hmm. you know it's it's always troubling to talk about what's available in these archives that. Um, you know, again, that present a narrative. And so this is really through technology. And I like the fact that a couple of things that you said, and I'm sorry, I wasn't here in the very beginning. So you might've touched on this earlier, but you know, you talked about um, um, the technology is not owned, right? It's not owned by the United States, by the Western world. And so, yay, you know, let's let's use it. And like you said, the sky's the limit, right? Let's do this. Let's, let's, um, 
let's preserve and, and tell our story this way, right? So this is very exciting. And then when you talk about uh, the other thing that you said, which somebody already commented on, which was uh, what counts as data, right? And so we've relied on looking at, um, you know, as an archivist, we have all these old resor resources that um, have been um, um, gathered, uh, created by, by not, not people, not us, right? We didn't create them. Uh, you know, we've been traditionally, you know, an oral, we've had a strong oral tradition. And, um, and the way we've used technology is to digitize what's been created, make that available on the web and so forth. But this is, this is basically saying enough of that. We're not, do, you know, we're, we're, we're going another direction here. And this is what we're going to do. So I'm very excited. I'm going to take what I've learned here to, uh, to proceed um, in, in, in a different way, looking at archives. So thank you. I appreciate this. This is exciting. Oh, yeah. Thanks, you know, and, and thanks for tuning in, especially with your, your background and training. I would, I would, I would add to that, um, the we, it, it really has to be community. Uh, it has to be the community that- Exactly, that exactly, yes. Stuff, you know, with the question, what counts as data? They, they define that, you know, not, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. So those are, those are really, uh, that's the, that's the way to go, I think. I, I, I don't, pretend to know exactly how to do it, but we, we, we try to stay as close. That's where the good relations comes in, you know, as a, as a part of the work that we're doing, so. Um, thank you, thank you, anyway. And thanks to uh, the Belmont Public Library for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for coming. Um, are there any other questions before we wrap up? Looks like someone has one. Let's see. You want to unmute yourself? My hi, Vince. Epi, oh my goodness. Hi. Been here yeah. all this time. Yes. Um, I have to say, um, your project is very wide ranging. Yeah. Um, you know. There's uh, the community aspect, there's the boat building itself, canoe building itself. Um, but I was very excited when you talked about Epeli. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, there were parts of your presentation that sounded very Epelian. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, Epeli is laughing up there. Yeah. Um, and, and when you got to the uh, virtual reality part, I went back to Epeli uh, because his big point, I think, was that, um, was the mis well, misconception of the West yeah. of the Pacific as small islands. Um, but he calls it our sea of islands. That's right. Uh, the, the sea is part of our islands. Yeah. So imagine what he's thinking as he watches you if you're virtual reality in my head i'm thinking your virtual reality thing would be dome like you know sort of like funnel like but like a dome and um sort of zooming in on the pacific but coming out to the real world but but because it's boat building in the um canoe building in the Pacific is that if that's going to be our focus. Um, yeah, it just hits what he said, you know, you're, you're talking about um, Pacific Islanders coming out to the world um, and sort of bringing with them what is theirs to, I don't know if he said enrich, but I'm sure he thought about enrich the world. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I'm like, oh God, it really must be very, very happy watching. Yeah, that means, that means a lot I, to me that you see that, that you know, I, that he was such a, a visionary. Thank you so much, uh, uh, um, I, I noticed the uh, Ani Fred, uh, the Jiman man himself uh, from, from, Traverse Bay Band of Odawa, who runs their canoe stuff. Oh, sorry, uh, Jiman, he's gonna he's gonna find me a dollar for saying canoe. Uh, <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, if you're still there, this is a 
Fred Harrington is a uh, Adawa uh, canoe people. <laughs> oh man, I forgot to put my shell on. You know, every time I go out, I wear that shell you guys gave me when we came to Guam. That was uh, that was. Uh, hey, it's good to see you. Are you guys still paddling to uh, to? Uh... Well, last uh, last year, my uh, I, ha I had both of my shoulders rebuilt, and I'm back. So why are you like skiing still? So uh, I'll be paddling this year. Let me know if we're in town. I'd like to bring bring it. Summer solstice, man. Same time every year. I, I think I'll go over on the 19th or the 20th. You gonna wear your skirt? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't expecting you to see expecting to see you here. This is great. The this Belmont Library talk with people from all over the world. Yeah, sorry I missed most of it. I, or, I see where we must be at the tail end, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, in fact, we're like fifteen minutes over. Yeah, we're just wrapping up, but the whole thing is recorded, um, so that's maybe a good note to end on. Um, I'll send you a link, uh, Fred. Great, <laughs> and I'll send it out to everybody as well. Um, thank you so much, Vince, for this wonderful talk. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you, brother. Likewise. Bye, Vince. Bye.